Welcome back to the now third video about the details of the amazing MEMSIG MMC5983MA 3-axis magnetic sensor. In the previous two videos, we did some magnetic field and temperature measurements and we read out the corresponding data from the chip and we also had a look at its status register, which is meager three meaningful bits. Uh, cards here, link in the description. Before we dive further into its functionality, we will have to talk, that is, do a deep dive into the inner workings of that thing. That is the anisotropic magnetoresistive or AMR sensors that that thing is using. I feel that's necessary to really understand what some of the commands that chip understands are really doing. Enjoy! But before we do a deep dive into AMR sensors, I want to revisit the magnetic field data we get back from that chip and maybe add one or two enhanced functions to read that data out, because that will enable us to, well, <coughs> view the effects of certain commands of that chip much better. We already went in part one, already carded a link in the description, over the registers containing the magnetic field data. It's basically 18 bits for each axis and an unsigned format. And uh, you are free to just use a 16-bit of the 18 bits and that's then called a 16-bit operations mode. Please note that this is really all the information you get about the X-out registers here in the data sheet. And it's the same for the Y-out and Z-out registers. On the front page of the data sheet, uh, basically in passing, the information is given that we have a full scale range of plus minus 8 Gauss with a 0.25 milligauss, uh, respectively 0.0625 milligauss resolution per LSB at 16 bits, uh, respectively 18 bits resolution mode. We already implemented in the first the details video, already called it, link in the description, these two methods here, which return us the raw axis output for each axis in 16 bit and in 32 bit, unsigned. But now we know it's really a plus minus range with a zero in the middle. So I have here two new methods, a raw axis output signed, which returns us a signed 32-bit integer, I'm no longer caring about the 16-bit values, okay? And a raw axis output in Gauss, which returns a float for each axis. Here's the implementation of the raw axis output signed method. So we know that according to the data sheet, the full scale range is plus minus 8 Gauss, so covering a total of 16 Gauss. We also know that according to the data sheet in 18-bit mode, and we will use 18-bit mode from here on out, is 0.0625 milligauss per least significant bit. So the maximum raw unsigned 18-bit value we can get is 2 to the power of 18 minus 1, or in decimal, 262,143. And if we multiply that with our LSB resolution of 0.0625 milligauss, we get 16.38 something, not 16, not plus minus 8. Uh, yeah, that's the first bummer. Now, and yes, I rearranged and corrected the last two <laughs> lines here between takes. Uh, 
Our LSB, if we uh, calculate it the other way around, is 16 Gauss, so 8 Gauss minus minus 8 Gauss, divided by our 18-bit range, the 2 to the power of 18 minus 1, so 262,143, and that gives us a value of 0.061 and then something milligauss, not as stated in the datasheet, 0.0625 milligauss. So, <clears throat> what is true? The plus minus 8 gauss range or the <laughs> 0.0625 milligauss resolution per LSB? Well, we will have to pick one later on. Anyways, the center, so uh, zero gauss of our unsigned 18-bit value is of course the 262,143, so our 2 to the power of 18 minus 1 divided by 2. And that's unfortunately not an integer, that's 131,071.5. Uh, the nearest integer value is 131,072, that's 2 to the power of 17, 17 of course being 18 minus 1. And so accepting a rounding error here of uh, yeah half a least significant bit, I define our assigned raw access output as our raw access output 18 bits minus 131,072. And that should, in theory, put 0g square at the middle of our value range. Now for the raw access output in Gauss. So we take our raw access output 18 bits again, and this time, because we are now in the float domain, uh, we take actually the exact center value of uh, 131,071.5 and subtract that. And then we just make a decision and we believe that the 0.0625 milligauss per LSB is yeah, <clears throat> the truth, according to the datasheet, and that they were just too lazy uh, to write something else here uh, than plus minus uh, approximately 8 gauss, like uh, plus minus uh, 16 point uh, one whatever gauss, okay? It's a decision, but uh, the same decision has been made in the other library, the already existing library for the chip that I showed you in the basics video card here, link in the description. So we take here our center value and then we plus minus now and then multiply it with 0.000625 Gauss. And that gives us our raw access value in Gauss, hopefully. Now, in the sketch itself, I uh, commented out everything that would print anything onto the serial port because I want to use the serial plotter. Instead, I'm uh, printing out here labels for <coughs> six lines on our serial plotter that is unsigned X, Y, Z and signed X, Y, Z. And then in the loop, I have a delay of 100. I take my magnetic field measurement, I read my axis output, and then I print out the raw 18-bit values from the X, Y, and Z axis and the signed values of my X, Y, and Z axis. And we just trust that that <laughs> raw access output Gauss is working. I mean, uh, it's trivial. And here we see the output on the serial plotter. So the top lines here at about -ish, yeah, 14,000. Uh, these are our unsigned, of course, X, Y, and Z values, uh, blue, red, and green. And then down here, we have our signed raw output values, uh, 
X is orange, Y is uh, lilac, and then dark green is Z. And if I now rotate my ship, you can see that the curves are doing basically exactly the same, uh, but the signed stuff is going on around the zero line. And yeah, currently that's only happening for the X and Y axis, but I can do the same for the Z axis, of course, when I rotate it this way. Yeah, <clears throat> that's it, almost. In the sketch I'm printing out now here only the label for the signed outputs and only printing out the value of the signed outputs. And now you can see the dance <laughs> of our values around the zero line. Uh, well, the dance according to sine cosine uh, of the angle of the dangle here. <sighs> around the zero value of our, yeah, outputs x and y, and we can do the same for the z output. Very nice. It's finally time to talk about those anisotropic magnetoresistive AMR sensor stuff. And in the theory of operation of that chip, it states that these are special resistors made of palm oli thin film, yeah, deposited on a silicon wafer. I have to apologize at that point because in the basics video, I already covered it, I think, link in the description, I stated that I choose that chip here as the best in its class. The class being Hall effect magnetic sensors. And of course, that chip doesn't use a Hall effect. So, what is an anisotropic magnetic? magnetoresistive sensor. To observe anisotropic magnetoresistance or AMR, you first need a very thin film of a palm alloy or yeah, a ferromagnetic material like for example nickel iron. That is a material that can yeah, perm permanently be magnetized and that can conduct electricity. Next, you need to send a current through your very thin film here and measure its resistance. If you now apply a magnetic field in the plane of our thin film, the resistance will change in the following way. When the magnetic field lines are parallel to our current flow, so either at yeah, a phi here 0 degrees or 180 degrees, you will get a maximum increase in resistance. Please note that the direction of the magnetic field uh, doesn't make any difference as long as it's parallel. So you get a maximum increase in resistance at 0 degrees and 180 degrees. If the magnetic field is at a 90 degree angle to the current or a 270 degree angle to the current, you get a maximum decrease of the resistance. Again, the direction of the magnetic field lines uh, really doesn't matter. Finally, if the magnetic field lines are at a 45 degree angle, a 135 degree angle, a 225 degree angle or a 350 degree, uh, <laughs> degree angle to our current, we observe no change in the resistance. Again, uh, yeah, the direction of the field lines uh, doesn't really play any role.
Also, if you have a magnetic field that is perfectly perpendicular, so at a 90 degree angle to the plane of our thin film, you get no effect at all all and uh, direction again doesn't play a role. However, if that magnetic field is not at a 90 degree angle, but uh, yeah, at for example a 45 degree angle, you get some effect because then you have a small component of the magnetic field that is in the plane of the thin film. And this follows also of course a sine cosine function. If you plot just the change of resistance, delta R, alongside here our angle phi between 0 and 360 degrees, you get that curve here. Yeah, with the two minimas and the two maximas, 0 and 360 degree is of course uh, the same again. And the four zero points where is, there's no change in resistance. And this curve here is proportional to the cosine of two times our angle phi. So yeah, basically we have here a, <laughs> a, a two hertz curve. And the change, the delta in resistance is proportional if the field, the magnetic field is really just in the plane of our thin film, uh, proportional to the strength of that magnetic field. If that magnetic field is at an angle of to our thin film, we talked about that, then it's proportional to the strength of the field times the cosine of the angle to this film being that zero degrees and that 90 degrees. So how does the whole thing actually work? Well, unlike Hall elements, which you can explain by means of classical physics, and I've done that in another video, a uh, card here, link in the description, uh, to <laughs> explain anisotropic magnetoresistance, you need first <laughs> relativity theory and second quantum mechanics. And I won't do that in this video. I'm sorry, that's, that's really beyond me. But to give you some buzzwords, the magnetic field influences the spin of the electrons that are in orbits, that is, <clears throat> quantum mechanics clouds around our atoms and those change their um, electron fine structure or something. And therefore you need more or less energy resistance to get electrons flowing here through the material. Uh, but yeah, uh, let's leave it at that. Unfortunately, we are not yet done, because uh, here in the theory of operation, it continues. A strong magnetic field is applied to the film to orient its magnetic domains in the same direction. Basically, yeah, we have a palm ally here, so we can pre-magnetize it and uh, yeah, forget about that during manufacturing for just for a second. Establishing a magnetization vector, yeah, a pre-magnetization. We have a north and a south pole in our material. Subsequently, an external magnetic field applied, and we skip that, causes the magnetization to rotate and change angle. Let's have a look at that. There's a lot left unsaid in that theory of operation. Anyway, let's assume we magnetize our palm alloy thin film here. Remember palm alloy, it's magnetizable at a 45 degree angle to our current flow here through that thing. That will not change its resistance. Remember at 45 degrees, 135 degrees and so on, no change of resistance, no delta R. Now, if we have an external magnetic field overlaid that is weaker, well, very important, weaker than our pre-magnetization here, we can change the angle. So uh, if the field, the external field is in the direction here of our pre-magnetization, nothing happens. We are still at 
45 degrees, no change in resistance. If it's in the opposite direction exactly, we just weaken our internal magnetic field and we are still at 45 degrees, no change in resistance. But if we re uh, rotate here, we change our angle and in this case we decrease the resistance. And if we rotate here further, we change our angle in the other direction, yeah, going more parallel to the current and we increase the resistance. The maximum increase being of course here at a 90 degree angle to our pre-magnetization and the maximum decrease also at uh, yeah the other 90 degree angle. I will show you a curve in a second to the magnetization. To summarize, as we rotate our external magnetic field, the resulting field, yeah, overlaid to our pre-magnetization, changes the angle and we get here a zone where the resistance is decreased and we get a zone here, one zone, where the resistance is increased. And ah, guess what? <laughs> Our sensor is now directional. It can detect the direction of the external magnetic field. And here we have the plot of the change of resistance delta R over the relative angle of our external field to our pre-magnetization. So 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees and back to 360 degrees. And that curve is now proportional to the negative sign of our angle alpha. So no longer that two hertz funny business here or basically two periods of our trigonometric function within 330 degrees, but really only one period, one sine curve. Now, if we would have pre-magnetized our perm alloy film at an angle of minus 45 degrees uh, relative to the current flow instead of 45 degrees, then our zones of decreased resistance and increased resistance would flip around, of course. And that would lead in our plot here to a 180 degree phase shift. That's the <clears throat> barely visible dotted line here. I messed that up in the drawing, I'm sorry. And yeah, that line is of course proportional to the sine of our angle alpha. Keep that in mind, it will come in handy in a minute. And so we come to the next important and uh, for now last statement here in our theory of, of operation. The MEMSIC AMR sensor is incorporated into a Wheatstone bridge configuration to maximize a signal to noise ratio. Yeah, we have seen that thing is really no noise. And these Wheatstone bridges, in our case uh, consisting of four AMR sensors, are also symbolized here in the functional block diagram. So one Wheatstone bridge for each of the axes. I've already shown you that by simply changing the angle of the pre-magnetization to the current flow, you can rotate or flip the zones where an external magnetic field will either increase the resistance or decrease the resistance. But there are two more permutations to that game. These were the two possibilities we already explored in detail. So the pre-magnetization at an angle to the current at 45 degrees and the pre-magnetization at an angle to the current at, yeah, uh, minus 45 or 315 degrees. But there are, as I mentioned, two more possibilities. 
you can have the angle of our pre-magnetization at 225 degrees relative to our current flow or at 135 degrees relative to our current flow. And each time you rotate the zones where an external magnetic field would either decrease or increase the resistance by another 90 degrees. Please note that this pair and this pair of permutations can also be created by just flipping the direction of the pre-magnetization. Keep that in mind. Now we have everything to build our AMR sensor Wheatstone bridge consisting of four single AMR sensors that are all pre-magnetized in the same direction. The exact geometry with 90 degree angles and uh, 45 degree angles everywhere is of course important. Anyway, we feed in a stabilized, hopefully stabilized voltage here at the top and we connect uh, the bottom to ground and then we have here a differential output out plus and out minus given by yeah the two voltage dividers here in each arm. If we now apply an external magnetic field in that direction, the resistance of these two AMR sensors will decrease and the resistance of these two AMR sensors will increase. So our out plus voltage will increase and our out minus voltage will decrease. If we flip around our external magnetic field 180 degrees, everything else flips around too. So we have now a resistance increase in that sensor and that sensor and a decrease in that sensor and that sensor. So out plus goes down and out minus is increased. If the magnetic field comes from a 90 degree direction or a 270 degree direction, the resistance of our AMR sensors is not changed and out plus should be, if everything is really completely symmetrical, equal to out minus. So our differential output voltage would be zero. In between we do the usual, in this case, a cosine dance here. So our output voltage maximum amplitude is of course proportional to the strength of our external magnetic field and it follows or is proportional uh, to the cosine of the angle of the magnetic field. Using four AMR sensors in such a Wheatstone bridge configuration has two advantages. First, the AMR effects in each of the sensors amplify each other. So we get a better signal to noise ratio as we have already seen. Second, we no longer need <laughs> to measure a resistance, which is always a pain in the behind. Instead, we can feed the differential output of our Wheatstone bridge directly into a differential analog to digital converter. And two last remarks. If we were to flip the orientation of our pre-magnetization 180 degrees, the output of our Wheatstone bridge would also be just flipped here, the dotted line, so we would get the negative output, which would be proportional to the minus cosine of our angle alpha. And lastly, the actual layout on the chip of these AMR Wheatstone bridges might be much more complicated. For example, employing a whole lot of single AMR sensor elements in each arm of the Wheatstone bridge to further increase the signal to noise ratio. That figure came out of a paper from Markevicius et al. Uh, sorry for slaughtering your name, uh, link in the description. That brings us to the last important statement in the theory of operation. 
The MEMSIC magnetic sensor has an on-ship magnetically coupled strap. A set reset strap pulse with a high current to provide the restoring magnetic field. Well, it's not quite English, but... It basically means we have somewhere a coil here near our Wheatstone bridge, which can be used to either pre-magnetize our AMR sensors in one direction or in the other direction. That brings us back to my cheat sheet for the status and control registers. In the internal control register 0, we find a set and a reset bit. If we write a 1 to the set bit, yeah, that will reset automatically back to 0 after the operation is done, we will send a hard current through that coil and set the pre-magnetization of our AMR sensors. If we write a 1 to reset, we will reverse the pre-magnetization of our AMR sensors. Okay, let's go real quick over the implementation of these two new, as I call them, basic commands. And that is the set sensor magnetization and reset sensor mag magnetization. Nothing new here, they just work exactly like uh, take magnetic field measurement and take temperature measurement. So, of course, we have also in our header file of the library two new bits here uh, for a set operation bit and reset operation bit in our control register zero. And then we have the implementation of those public methods here and they are really exactly the same, just yeah, setting another bit here like the take temperature measurement stuff and the take magnetic field measurement stuff. Before we do a little experiment with these two new methods, uh, let's look at the status quo of our chip as it is. So here now in the init, I just print out one label X for our serial plotter. And here in the loop, I do the usual uh, delay, take magnetic field measurement, read access output. But then I only for now output the X axis. Okay, let's have a look at the serial plotter. Okay, I've rotated here my chip in a direction where I get the maximum output on the x-axis. I can, yeah, turn it again 360 degrees and we see that little dance here. Wonderful, let's go back. So I want you to note if I orient that in this direction here, approximately we get our maximum output. So uh, yeah, uh, about 4,000, positive 4,000. Okay, now I extended my loop a little bit. I introduced here a static bind count, which is initialized to zero the first time only loop is called. Then I increase count here by one, and then I have that little switch statement here. So if count is one, then I perform a set sensor magnetization operation. And if count is 21, then I perform a reset sensor magnetization. And uh, at count 41, I revert count back to zero and we start again with that logic. The left, uh, the rest is unchanged. So every about -ish, uh, two seconds, 2.1 seconds, uh, we should see something happening on our serial plotter. Let's have a look. And indeed, every two seconds, the output on our X channel uh, flips <laughs> its polarity. And yeah, uh, this also works, of course, for any values in between. It's, oops, mouse, uh, quite hilarious, actually. Um, 
Okay, so yeah, <clears throat> that was the demonstration. There's uh, one question I still want to answer here. And that is, uh, if you do a power on reset, <laughs> Does that thing really revert to the default orientation? And I wait until it's a reset and then I pull the power. Da -da -dum. Uh, you probably didn't hear that. Uh, let's back, uh, go to the loop and change the code again. So yeah, I uh, commented everything out here in the loop. And if we now look at the serial monitor again, I align again into the direction. Yeah, it was uh, approximately here, but uh, yes, we get a positive output again. So that thing really resets to, yeah, or that performs a set operation every time it resets or gets powered on. That's good to know. That's it for today. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, a little longer video this time, but I felt really, uh, yeah, it was necessary to dive a little bit into that AMR sensor stuff. By the way, those AMR sensors are also used in hard disk heads to read, yeah, <clears throat> the magnetization on your platters, your bits and bytes. Anyway, uh, next time we will uh, just continue normally with uh, more software, more code going through my cheat sheet of the control and status registers. Till then, bye.